Uh, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Thomas Tock. I am director of Future Ed, an independent think tank at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. Uh, McCourt and Future Ed are very pleased to host today's panel discussion of Common Sense Evidence, the Educator's Guide to Using Data and Research, a new book by McCourt Associate Professor and Future Ed Research Advisor Nora Gordon and Carrie Conaway of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Education research, as many of you know, is a massive enterprise. Universities, consulting companies, think tanks, and many others produce tremendous numbers of studies on every imaginable topic. The American Educational Research Association draws tens of thousands of people to its annual conferences. How can we help practitioners and policymakers make the best use of this vast resource? And what can the research sector do to make its work as useful as possible to education policymakers and practitioners? We are pleased to have two insightful commentators join Nora in exploring the answers to these questions this afternoon. William Corrin is a director of the K-12 Education Research Program at MRDC, a nonprofit, nonpartisan education and social policy research organization that was launched in 1974 by the Ford Foundation and several federal agencies. He has also served as director of research, evaluation, and assessment for the Evanston, Illinois School District, so has uh, been on both sides uh, of the research fence. Emily Hanford, a, jur a journalist, is a senior producer and correspondent for APM Reports, which is the documentary and investigative reporting team at American Public Media, where she is an avid consumer of education research. Uh, we're gonna start with a panel discussion and then bring the audience into the conversation a little bit later. Uh, you can share questions uh, beginning uh, now even uh, via the Q&A button on your screen. And for those who are tweeting, the hashtag for the discussion this afternoon is common sense evidence, hashtag common sense evidence. So uh, let's start at the beginning. Nora, why did you write the book? Thanks, Tom. Thanks so much for hosting this event. Great to be here with Future Ed and you know a lot of people from the McCourt School out here. So hi to all my students. Um, so Carrie and I wrote this book. Uh, we kind of came to it from two different perspectives. So as you noted, she's now at Harvard. Um, but before that, she was a research and strategy director in the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, she worked, you know, obviously with within the state agency with lots of school districts, different research practice partnerships. Um, and I came to it from within academia as a researcher and teaching students a lot of research skills. Um, but despite these two different angles, we came to it with a very similar vision. Uh, what we wanted to do was give education leaders and practitioners a framework and a set of basic tools for using evidence themselves uh, because we want their answers to get, their questions to get answered. Um, for me, this came, you know, when you're an education researcher and people know that just in your personal life, people ask you a lot of questions and they send their friends to you. And it's very interesting. I mean, if you're watching this and you're my friend, keep sending me your people, uh, get good ideas this way. But what drove me to think of this as a book project was conversations I had with a bunch of advocates, including some very driven parents um, with a lot in common to some of the people Emily has highlighted in her reporting, who are self-taught on topics from neuroscience to state and local budgeting, um, really getting out there and advocating for their kids and then getting stuck because they're told they don't have evidence to support what they're doing. And they don't know what that would mean. They don't know how to get that, um, how to get there, even though they've learned lots of other things. So then it seems like knowing evidence is this gatekeeping process um, that really affects power dynamics. And those who don't have formal research training are disadvantaged. So we wrote this book because we wanted to open up access to what is evidence and get more people in the conversation and empower the leaders who are on the ground doing the work.
Sorry, Tom, you're muted. Sorry. So, in, thank you. In, in part, you, you've written what we might call a, a meditation on, on what constitutes evidence in, in education debates. Can, can you explain that a little bit? Sure. I think what some of these people were being told when people were sort of holding up evidence to shut down their arguments was people were having a narrow view of evidence, thinking about academic research. It gets published in peer-reviewed journals. Usually in education, it's about something pretty narrow, like a very specific intervention or a program. It's being judged by how big is the effect size, um, how statistically significant is the impact on some student outcome, very often a test score. And that view of evidence really starts with kind of an answer, like this thing worked or this thing didn't work. And we want to open that up and our view really starts with asking a lot of questions and letting people think that there's more different types of questions that they might inform with evidence. So ask questions to really think about what the problem is before you jump into thinking about what intervention is best. Um, asking questions about implementing different strategies. What will it take to do it well? Do you expect this to work in your setting um, as opposed to the setting where it may have been originally evaluated? And also asking those questions about the impact of a strategy, but including many more strategies rather than just purchasing particular educational materials. Um, and, you know, again, thinking about this question about relevance in the local context. Great, thanks. So William, uh, as I said at the outset, you, you've been on sort of both sides of the, the uh, education research fence. How do you uh, think about evidence? Yeah, I mean, I think the way that, that Norris framed it is right in terms of, you know, you gotta have good questions to drive um, the information that you need. I mean, I think evidence can come in a lot of different forms um, at different levels of rigor, um, different degrees of relevance. Um, so I think, you know, a, a lot of thinking about evidence is what's the information I need to make the best decision possible in my policy context. Um, so a lot of the work I've done, frankly, on, on both sides of that fence, both working within a district and now working for a research organization, is about, you know, what's the best information possible we can provide, sort of the most convincing and most relevant information we can provide to answer the sort of policy or program or practice question um, that's of importance in a given educational setting. At the end of the day, I always hope that all of us are doing this work because what we care about is the outcomes of students. And so if that's kind of the North Star and where we're focused, then how do we generate the information that allows us to know whether we've sort of done the best we can for these students? And depending on context and a variety of factors we may discuss later, you know, the, the, the degree to which we're convinced by that may vary, but ideally we do our best to try to understand have we done our best. Yeah. So when you were in the Evanston School District, how did you define good or dependable research? Uh, and how did you go about finding it in, in what is a, a sea of research studies? Right. I mean, in some ways, I, I, I'll back into that. You know, my initial charge when I was hired was actually about how do we generate our own evidence within the district? How do we generate our own data? And a lot of the requests that were made from for me were things around how do we organize our data that we have? How do we um, year to year report consistently on some of the same indicators and some of the same things? Um, how can we best present information to our staff, to our school board, to our stakeholders? It meant for me, you know, things like, you know, going to a professional development session um, on data visualization. And this is back in 2000 and how best to sort of show stuff to people so they can digest it. So my initial charge had very little to do with sort of going out in the world and, and finding evidence. It had a lot to do with sort of how do we ask good questions and, and sort of how do we build the infrastructure we need within the district to consistently have access to the kinds of data we need. I think on the, on the, good, um, the good, better, best on the level of evidence when I you know, had the time to delve into that, I was sort of concurrently a graduate student at the same time. So I at least had the advantage of sort of 
reading education research and sociological research um, kind of at the same time I was trying to do my job, which was basically hard. Um, but uh, so for me, I was just, I was, I was learning some of the skills that it sounds like Nora teaches her students and trying to apply those lenses and then bring that to the superintendent and the assistant superintendent that I work for um, when I came across things that were relevant and help them assess all right, how, how, how far could we take this piece or that piece to address a problem we're facing in our district? Thanks. So Emily, as a, as a journalist, you are a regular consumer of education research. You're, you're a, uh, an adjudicator of it uh, to, to a significant degree. Uh, what are your sort of initial reflections on, on the research landscape and on, on notions of evidence and the like? Well, um, I've been an education reporter for since 2008. And one of the things that I've been interested in all along is sort of the question of research to practice, like how and if and whether research really makes it into the classroom and what's going on in the classroom is sort of informed by research evidence. And I've also been really interested in questions about how people learn and how much is being learned about how people learn over the past 30, 40, 50 years. And what happened is um, a few years, so I was interested in that and was doing that in various ways. Um, and then a few years ago, I kind of discovered something that was really shocking to me. And it was through parents, sort of who Nora just uh, mentioned, uh, parents who I was hearing from all over the country whose kids were struggling learning how to read. And they were going to the schools and saying something's wrong. And they were getting kind of stymied in many ways. And, what, and, and that's kind of a long story about why they were being stymied. And I thought what Nora said was really interesting is that sort of um, evidence is sort of being used as like a gatekeeper and like a power dynamic, like these, these um, parents who were just asking basic questions, like, I think my kid isn't really learning how to read. And the school was sort of like, don't worry, he'll be fine, it'll be fine, we've got some help for him. And then, you know, third, fourth, fifth grade, the kid's still not really learning how to read. So basically to make a long term story short, what, what I wasn't aware of as a researcher was this gigantic body of evidence that exists, basic scientific research in cognitive science and other areas that has investigated very elemental and profound questions of like, what is reading and how do we, how do we learn how to do it? And what do kids need to learn to become good readers? And what's really interesting is this gigantic body of research has happened sort of next to or outside of the world of education research, which is a big broad bucket in and of itself. Yeah. And a lot of the findings from the cognitive science research from the more basic research actually call into question some of the findings or some of the practices, philosophies, theories, things that have been in place um, that are strongly held beliefs and traditions and practices that have been happening for a long time in, in schools around how you teach reading and what kids should learn to become good readers. And there's this big disconnect. And so one of the things that I really appreciate about this book is the way that Nora uh, and Kathy, sorry, Kathy, did I get her name right? Uh, why, how they together um, really talk about how important it is to expand notions of evidence. Because some of the ways that it's been defined by the federal government and other gatekeepers is sort of overly narrow. And you have, and so it's very important to think more evidence, but you also have this really, um, sorry, Carrie is your co-author, um, this ironic thing uh, that happens. Uh, so it's important to be like, expand the evidence, but in the world of reading, and we can talk about this more, you end up with this kind of like, well, there's a lot of different research and it says a lot of different things. And I have my science and you have your science and we can agree to disagree at the end of the day. And that is doing harm to a lot of children because we know a lot about how kids learn to read and a lot of stuff that would align, that aligns with that scientific research is not happening in schools or even more shockingly, stuff that is that actually gets in the way of kids learning how to read is sort of being done in the name of, that's the way we've always done it and I have my research that supports it. Well, uh, that's both striking and disappointing. Uh, why do you think, what did you learn to be the, the reasons for uh, the credible consensus research not making its way into classrooms? Well, it's a big complicated answer. I don't know if I've got the, an the answer to that one completely. Um, but I think 
as is discussed in this book, one of the things that happens is even though it's a huge enterprise, education research and just research in the learning sciences and everything are at large, we have a ton of research, we have answers to a lot of questions. Um, uh, pe people can kind of, like in our world today, you can kind of find anything to support what you believe. <laughs> and there's kind of always a study for that. And, um, and as we know, in the, the federal law, uh, you really only need at this point really one study to back up. So once you find the study that's the thing you already believe, then you're good to go. So you're kind of like, uh, you're okay if you're, your practice is backed up by something, even if there's a gigantic body of evidence that you may or may not even know about that has come to a very different conclusion. So I think the problem is that a lot of the things we do as human beings, we are driven by our beliefs and, and we are looking for things to confirm those beliefs and we all do it even when we try really hard not to. And I think that education may be especially afflicted by this one, um, that people really have strong beliefs about, for example, how kids should be taught to read and what classrooms for little children should look like. And they're um, looking for things that affirm those beliefs and maybe just not even aware of a body of evidence that says something else. If I can that's a, jump that's in also on. Discouraging. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is kind of depressing. Um, so, but it, it leads, I guess, to, to uh, a sort of broader question, uh, which is related to your answer, which is, uh, in part, there's just such a welter of, of research. Uh, there's just massive amounts of it. So, so Nora, can, can you take a, a, a shot at explaining why there is so much research, uh, perhaps even more than we could possibly use? Yeah, there's a lot of research. Um, I mean, in part, it comes from what are the incentives in academia? There's a lot of research because there's a lot of professors and they um, need to publish their research to get promoted, get tenured, be recognized within the academy. And uh, I don't, I mean, of course I am one of those people and I don't mean to <laughs> say the whole, you know, enterprise is, um, somehow not driven by actual intellectual pursuits. Of course, like that's why people decide to become researchers. They wanna do research, but then sort of when you're in it, there are these very strong incentives for publishing your work. Um, and you know, there's been um, a lot of buzz lately about this replication crisis in social science, how many papers don't replicate um, and it's something called p-hacking, uh, this idea that researchers are kind of trying different specifications until they get to something that they think is going to satisfy, um, you know, whoever's making an editorial decision. Uh, and I think, you know, we sort of have enough evidence on that to think that's got to be going on. Um, but there's also a lot of really good research. And I would say, you know, if you see someone um, researching some educational strategy, like you want to know about class size reduction, or you want to know about a particular reading curriculum or universal pre-K, all of these things, you know, they could work really differently in different places. And so you will see lots of research because it's a valid question to know how are they working out when they were implemented in different contexts or slight variations on the program. But what all of this means is that what Emily describes, this tendency of you're looking for a study and you see a study and then you stop, it's not realistic to expect anybody to do a thorough review of this landscape. Um, and so just looking at one study is especially dangerous. That's why um, the approach we take in the book of thinking of kind of getting your questions set up before you find the answers can be useful because you start reading something and it seems very persuasive um, and you might not be thinking, oh, but it's not answering all of these other questions that I had about whether it would be appropriate in my particular setting. Interesting. So Emily suggests that, that the disconnect, uh, if that's what we should call it, between uh, research and, and practice is in part a demand side issue that, and you're suggesting that the, the same to a certain extent, Nora, that is that, that uh, people are uh, looking for work that's 
substantiates their ideas. Uh, they are not consuming uh, research sort of objectively. But I, I think it's also uh, clear to, to anyone working in education policy for a while that certain research centers publish only papers finding, say, school choice uh, is good for students. And there are centers that uh, routinely publish papers finding only that school choice is bad for students. So this is a supply side problem. Uh, how do we sort of sort that out? How do we, it, this is a trust issue to a certain extent and, and sort of, you know, sort of knowing your sources as, as Emily might say in journalism, uh, you know, understanding who, what you're going to uh, get from whom, um, but but it's a it's a large problem for people who don't go into on the on the uh, practitioner and policymaker side who don't go uh, looking uh, objectively at, at the uh, supply side. I mean that's a very valid point. It's something we try to cover in the book in terms of how do you assess different sources um, and when you're thinking about. Sometimes it's easier, like you said, some places that always have studies that reach the same conclusions and they're really advocacy organizations. Um, and then, you know, say, well, see what else they put out. Are they always saying the same thing? See where the money is coming from. Although that can be hard too, because, you know, with a lot of philanthropy, there's a lot of um, education philanthropy that has clear policy agendas, but it might not be obvious um, to, the observer, if you're just kind of looking at one study and seeing who funded it, that, that might not be meaningful to you. Um, but I think, again, if you're going in thinking, these are the things I want to learn, and then thinking, oh, well, this is a report that's all about how something is so great or something is so terrible, but it's not actually answering the questions, then you have your own sniff test. And I would say, I mean, there's so many policy relevant questions that you only find stuff on from advocacy groups um, because the academic publishing cycle is so long or because you know it's such a specific or a local issue um, that you're not going to find academic research on it and so i wouldn't say disregard those sources i think you just want to know what you're looking for and maybe you'll be skimming through some whole report and you'll find like a few numbers that are useful to you um, that really seem objective and what's not objective is what they're leaving out or the questions that they aren't posing. Yeah, thanks. William, uh, any other insights to add to that? Yeah, was, you know, there's, there's, um, it's a, it's a, there's certainly a sole source issue, right? You don't want to sort of be relying on on one particular site or one particular organization for all your information. And so even though it can be time challenging to sort of go to other sources, um, I think it's it's really important not to limit oneself to just one place. The other thing is, you know, there are sort of evidence aggregators and syntheses of research that exist out there. And those are really good options, especially if it's a um, sort of a broader topic in which you're interested and in. not every study that is synthesized in a given research review um, may, may touch specifically on your given need as a district or you know, as a school leader. Um, but it's a way to, to take, a, take a shot at maybe getting a broader sense of what's available out there. Um, you know, the, the different evidence, you know, synthesizers are going to vary a little bit in terms of what their focus is. Is their focus going to be on what practices made a difference or impact evaluations and causal research? And you'll see a lot of that, like in the What Works Clearinghouse, or whether you can find other places that focus on questions of implementation or issues of cost or sort of other practical features that you have to take into consideration when you're making a decision about pursuing a potential solution that seems to show some research of making a difference for kids, some evidence of making a difference for kids. So you mentioned the uh, What Works Clearinghouse as one source of, of uh, uh, insight into, into a range of studies on a given topic. Um, maybe not all of our uh, listeners are, are aware of it or familiar with it, maybe you could just describe it a bit. And if there are, are a couple of other uh, resources that you would suggest, uh, feel free to share those. 
Sure. Um, this is one of Nora and Carrie do a nice job in their book of listing some of these these research aggregator uh, locations. But the What Works Clearinghouse is through the U.S. Department of Education. Um, it's been around for a little while now. I actually think they've been improving over time on sort of the ability to search for different kinds of um, different types of research on different topics and accumulated more and more um, research sort of within the center. But essentially, it's a um, it's an arm of the U.S. Department of Education that periodically reviews studies um, that fall into different categories. It could be dropout reduction, for example. It could be elementary reading. Um, and they'll review essentially the rigor or quality of those studies um, and put them up against, you know, they set a very specific sort of way of assessing standards for the quality of that research that's anchored pretty heavily on this causal question in particular. Um, and how well it answers whether an intervention or program or family of programs may have addressed a particular issue. Um, but because there's, you know, you have sort of this independent group essentially that's continually reviewing studies and assessing their quality, it starts to build up a, you know, a mass of studies that you can go and, and check out and learn from. I would um, add to that that another part of the What Works Clearinghouse is that they put out these practice guides. So some of what they're doing are these study reviews that William just described where they really are going through, I mean, you can see there's these incredible training videos for the people who work for, you know, What Works Clearinghouse and how are you judging a study because they are trying to make it um, really neutral and hold all of the studies to the same statistical standards. Um, but then what that means, this question of, you know, what exactly is it that they're evaluating? Um, and if you're talking about something that is, you know, like a copyrighted curriculum or, you know, set of educational materials, then you really know what the thing is. Of course, you don't know what happened with the thing once somebody bought it um, and put it in the school, but at least you sort of know what the thing is. Um, Whereas if you're thinking about practices or you know just things that teachers might do in the classroom that wouldn't require them to buy something, there's no you know intellectual property involved. Um, those things you know get done in really different ways, and uh, it, so it, it becomes more challenging. But they do have these nice practice guides that they put out trying to synthesize it and I, those are kind of coming at it more from the angle of the question than the answer if you think that each study is one answer. I think um, if I can add on to that I think you have a really nice line in the book about the practice guides and you say that's where you go when you want to know what to do not what to buy and so th there's there's just like a grain of salt that everyone needs to keep in mind with everything. But the What Works Clearinghouse, Nora can do a better job of talking about sort of the limitations of what's up there when you're looking at the programs that they're looking at or the individual studies that they're looking at. It tells you something, but it doesn't tell you everything. For example, there could be a program in early reading that shows some evidence, causal, like there's a good study and it passes the What Works Clearinghouse um, you guidelines about what counts as a study and it shows some sort of effect um, and then you know the program which of course includes many things when it's come to reading right they might be doing many things to teach kids to read so you don't necessarily know what it is in the program that was working or not and what's interesting is you can see some programs and what works that sort of show evidence of effectiveness and then look in the practice guides and see that some of the things they might be doing in that program are in the practice guide as good things to do, but there might be some things in the practice guide that, that they're doing in the program that aren't in the practice guides for a reason, because <laughs> they're not good things to do when you teach kids to read. So I, as a journalist and as someone when I'm talking to parents, like Nora, I would recommend the practice guides overall because they are almost like a synthesis of the things we, the things that teachers do that have evidence behind them at work and work rather than a program that you can buy that might show evidence of working, but you don't know what it is exactly about it that works or not. Is that fair? So Emily, uh, let me ask you this. So you report uh, frequently as you've been suggesting on the very fraught topic of how best to teach students to read. Also the very important topic. Uh, and maybe the two go hand in hand, but 
something. My question is, how do you judge? Uh, because that's the role you're playing to an extent, uh, competing research on this issue. Well, I'm going to take a big picture view on this because I, I think, I think as I started doing this reporting, I actually started thinking about research in a different way than I really had before. I think I was thinking it, about it in a more narrow way, and I think I learned through it to think about it in the broader way that Nora's laying out in this book, actually, which is very important. And so I guess what I'll say is that there are certain sort of ideas that have been deeply held about reading. Um, and I'll just give you an example, like one that really sort of drives a lot of the assumptions. If you sort of tap down underneath what's going on in reading, there's an assumption that learning to read is a lot like learning how to talk, that it's essentially a similar process. It happens in the same kind of way. And the kids will become good readers if they're read to a lot and if they're motivated and interested in reading books. And there's room for a teacher to guide and to teach a little bit here and there, but that essentially reading comes in time. And the cognitive science research and other researchers really have looked at that question in various ways and have really come up to a pretty solid different finding, <laughs> which is learning to read is very different than learning to talk. And mo many kids will not become good readers unless they're explicitly taught how to do it. Some of us learn it very easily and don't need to be taught how to do it at all. But many of us really need to be taught how our written language works to get good at it. And some people, if they're not taught a lot, very explicitly how their written language works, they're really not going to learn to read much at all. They're not going to pick it up. So what happened really is that there was sort of curriculum and research and education sort of, a lot of it was built on that basic assumption. And then there's a lot of stuff around the edges and things that you do. And the cognitive scientists back in the 1970s sort of took that one on and a few other things that sort of flow out of that. And we're like, is that true? Let's test it. Let's like really, let's do this as scientists. Let's make a hypothesis. Let's test that. Let's see what happens. Let's refine our hypothesis. Let's build a body of evidence. And now 50 years later, there's this big body of evidence and the big body of evidence just leans in, like the ship is over here in terms of how reading works when you look at the world of cognitive science. And the ship is a little bit more over here when you look at the world of education, research and what's happening in schools. Those are very broad general statements. Um, so I don't know if I answered your precise question, but I actually feel like as a reporter, I have gone from trying to be very like focused on the little like what makes that study good or that study good and judging peer review, all these other ways that you can like look at who published it, who funded it. Those are all important questions. Was it peer reviewed, whatever. So to this much more, this broader thing that I discovered in reading is like writ large, you've got one body of evidence saying this and another body saying this and wow, the two are like this, and then kids learning how to read are in the middle here. And parents frustrated, like, hey, it's not coming together for my kid. Could someone please tell me what to do? And the school continually saying, like, a little nip and tuck approach, but it'll be fine. And then it's not. Yeah. So one consequence of, of what you're saying is that one uh, who, who uh, is in a, a adjudicating role like yourself as a journalist needs to be at this for a while. Uh, yes. You need to understand uh, that one study alone uh, is not going to be definitive, and, and you can only learn that by reading many studies over a period of time and, and watching the sort of uh, arc of evidence bend one way or another. Um, let, let that be a, 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 a note to uh, editors everywhere. And that's, that's true for any one individual. And it's also true like over time, right? Like we accumulate information over time. So if you're a reporter writing about this 20 years ago, there was a different sort of accumulation of evidence, right? And 20 or 30 years later. So it's like, I mean, and that's why as a journalist or as any human being, you have to keep checking your beliefs, your assumptions or whatever, and be like, oh, if there's something weighing you in another direction that, that yeah. goes against a lot of the stuff you formerly thought was true, um, you need to be willing to make a turn. And to, to follow up on that and back to the earlier discussion of what works clearinghouse, a whole body of evidence that Emily just described on the cognitive science stuff wouldn't be in the what works clearinghouse because it wouldn't be, you know, an educational intervention targeting an educational outcome. It would be, you know, brain scans or it would be something happening in a lab where there's not a student outcome measured. And so even if you think you're getting you know, you're, you're trying to read broadly within one literature, you're still missing this whole other piece of it. Well, I, I'm really glad you said that, uh, Nora, because it, it goes to one of your sort of big themes in the 
in the book, which you touched on in, uh, initially, uh, and, and that is, uh, you know, a random control, control trial, uh, you know, is not necessarily, you seem to be suggesting, uh, the only um, sort of measure of true evidence. Uh, and could you just expand on that a little bit more? Sure. I mean, I'll start. And I actually see we had a question that somebody submitted about this, about the, you know, randomized control trial or RCT as gold standard. Um, and that is really taking kind of a clinical medical model, thinking we're just going to randomize who, you know, like who's getting the real drug and who's getting the placebo and we'll be able to not worry about any kind of um, confounding factors about why some kids are experiencing one educational, you know, treatment or intervention and others are not. Um, and there, you know, has been this big push towards that in education with good reason, because different kids experience wildly different, you know, um, educational environments, and it's not random who's experiencing what. Um, and so that makes it really hard to say you want to know something like is one curriculum you know better than another when a school district chose a curriculum for a particular reason and families you know live in a school district and it's not random why they live there so th there is um you know it's really important there's a lot of research that does not acknowledge those types of problems and then really it's not very useful to draw inference from however you also have these limitations on the randomized control trials um, where, you know, you need, it's, it's a big undertaking um, depending on what you're evaluating. Um, but if you want to know something, maybe the most famous one in American education is Project Star in Tennessee that was a class size evaluation, um, randomizing class size in early elementary grades across public schools in Tennessee. And if you, you know, work in a state or a district or school, and you can imagine what would it take, you're literally having different class sizes within school buildings, and you're randomizing the teachers and randomizing the kids. Um, and, you know, th then you have an answer that isn't complicated by which kids go to schools with smaller classes or where do different teachers teach. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's a big undertaking. It's hard to get people to want to participate in those experiments. And honestly, there's much more experimental evidence like that generated in education in the context of developing, developing countries where there's a real resource constraint. And so you're saying, oh, if you're gonna randomize which village gets any school building, you know, if the counterfactual is there's no school buildings, yeah, we'll take the randomization and that's harder to pull off in the United States. Um, so it's compelling evidence and all else equal, you know, if you said this is something that comes from an RCT and this is something on exactly the same topic that doesn't, I'd take the RCT but it just really limits um, the set of strategies that you can understand and evaluate. And one problem if you're like, okay, if I've got an RCT, if one strategy that has a great RCT that shows effects and then one that doesn't have any research at all, yeah, you might wanna take the one with the RCT, but the problem is a lot of things we're never gonna get in a randomized controlled trial. Like it's just, it's just so you'd, maybe that thing that isn't studied is better. <laughs> and maybe if you look at some of the theoretical evidence or some of the evidence, for example, from like how we learn, maybe it makes more sense. Maybe it would be better. So you, you might want to choose something that doesn't have a randomized trial just because it's so hard to get one. So it's very few programs that are going to get that kind of evidence behind it. So when people say only choose things from the What Works Clearinghouse, it makes very little sense because there's just, that's just leaving a whole lot of stuff that's possibly good and there might be other evidence showing it's good that you're leaving off the table. And of course, the other problem with things like randomized controlled trials, sort of like we were talking about with developing countries, is if a body of research shows that something is not good for children, are you going to, rand are you going to randomly put kids in the thing that's not good and compare them to things that are good? In some ways, some of the practices that are going around in school and early reading instruction, I think it would be unethical to put, to create that kind of experimental situation. Oh, I, I, mean, I, I, gotta my, I gotta get my comment in since 
I've done a whole bunch of randomized controlled trials um, uh, at, at, at different scales. So, um, I, you know, it, it goes back, there's a couple of factors to keep in mind around thinking about evidence. So one is what I said earlier, which is, can you generate the best information possible to answer the question at hand, to make the best decision in response to that question? And so if it's a causal question, and it's something that could be addressed through a randomized design, that, that's gonna be your gold standard to really understand whether that particular thing made a, made a difference or not. Um, I think the second is, you know, we always have to consider the level of, of risk we're willing to take of getting the wrong answer. So research is very good at identifying problems. Um, it can be used really well to identify what questions should we be asking. We can identify disparate outcomes for different kinds of kids, different kinds of districts, um, issues of not meeting standards in particular academic subjects. Research is, re is really good at that. Um, and then we get this good question, then we want to answer it. And depending on what that question is, what's our tolerance for potentially getting the wrong answer? So that's where the research rigor or the convincingness of the research matters. The higher the level of risk, and the good news is unlike medical science where you may be talking about a patient who's gonna die on the table, that's typically not what we're talking about in schools. But if we're thinking about mental health interventions in schools, that might actually be a pretty high risk question and it's about reducing teen suicide. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna want my level of evidence to be, to be pretty strong in that kind of situation. Um, so, so there's that, that's another feature that, that always needs to come in when we're talking about the evidence we're bringing to bear is what's our tolerance for potentially having the wrong answer. And in some cases, getting the wrong answer is, isn't gonna be hugely disruptive. It may be about very specific instructional practices within a classroom. It may be okay if for a few units we did something that wasn't the best way pedagogically to do that thing. Um, but there are gonna be other cases where that matters more. I think the last thought I have is that um, in this concept of bringing the best information possible to make the best decision possible, I do think we all have to be pushing ourselves to ask like one more question. Is there one more way that I can kind of corner this question and do something a little better? Can I have a little more clarity about my comparison group? And that's, you know, that's outside of the randomized controlled trial, but it's that you know, always pushing ourselves, especially in the merging of research and practice to say, is, is there sort of one more element that I can put in here? Can I, can I actually look at trend over time, but also identify a comparison group for that trend over time? You know, can I add one more thing that makes my rigor just a little bit better? And it's not going to, it's not going to break me to do that. So that's the, like, I constantly want people to just nudge themselves a little bit more to say, can I raise the bar a little bit as I'm generating sort of evidence within my sphere? Great, thank you, William, that's really helpful. So we've got a lot of questions uh, from people who are watching and thank you uh, for all of you who uh, have shared them. Uh, we're gonna uh, try to take a few of those now if we can. And let's see. Um, so we've got a, a question from uh, Norma Ming from uh, San Francisco Unified, uh, who says, uh, much of what can drive the education system comes from accountability. What opportunities do you see in the policy world to improve the reporting expectations for districts, uh, i.e. ESSA and beyond, <clears throat> to focus on aligned practices and, and not just outcome metrics? I'll, I'll jump in with that one. Um, it's a great question. And I feel like for some people who may be less familiar with the historical arc here, I mean, it's like the pendulum is swinging. So before we were focused on outcomes, there, there was more focus on inputs. And then this idea that let's see what comes out, you know, and do what you will to, to get there in your agile, nimble way. Um, and I think um, in ESSA, there are new reporting um, requirements for districts in terms of the spending at individual school buildings um, measured in dollars, not measured in staff. And so that's new. And sometimes that's something that people who haven't um, 
you know, aren't, aren't so familiar with it are surprised by it because it would seem like, oh, well, schools must have dollars associated with them. And in many cases, that's, that's been kind of hard to see. Um, so I think that um, that is, is one question. It's not really about process um, of what are you doing with the money, but at least about thinking, you know, how equitably are the resources spread across the schools? Because again, a lot of the accountability stuff is focused on um, gaps and, you know, looking at individual subgroups of students um, to make sure that they are served equitably. But I, I think it would actually be quite hard. And I feel like the, um, when different researchers over the decades have tried to kind of um, you know, record and code up what is happening inside the classroom. Um, it's my understanding that that is a very challenging thing to do. Uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to that. Yeah, it's, that's actually a pretty tricky question. Um, but I think I agree with your last statement. I mean, the other thing is, you know, we, we count on schools and districts to report up for accountability purposes. So it also has to do with, you know, as, as practitioners, what capacity do we have to report on what things with sort of what level of confidence? And so for something like practices within the school, um, you know, who, who is it that's sort of in charge of, you know, making sure they're collecting sort of comparable data from the different classrooms, for example, or about certain practices and understanding if it's reporting up to district level, how that compares school to school and from school leader to school leader. So it's, it's, a, little, it's a little messier. I mean, I think the, the, around accountability, you know, again, if we're driven by this idea of, you know, what are we trying to achieve for the students that we serve, right? So what outcomes do we wanna see for them? You know, there's, there's a lot of questions we can ask about actually what are the right metrics that should be in those accountability measures but at the end of the day, as, as parents and practitioners, we have certain hopes for where these kids arrive by the, I say kids, students, because I guess we could think about this from early ed all the way through post-secondary. Um, you know, what are our hopes for sort of where they end up and what, what kind of toolkit of skills and knowledge that they have? Um, so I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough, I think it's a tough one to figure out how to practically include practices into some sort of semi-standardized accountability measure. I think one thing that makes that hard also, um, it, and now I'm not thinking about policy accountability, but accountability more um, organically, like being accountable to parents and communities is that you don't know exactly what you're looking for. And I'm actually remembering several years ago when one of Emily's first reading documentaries was out and a bunch of my friends and I were listening to it and we're like texting each other photos from back to school night of the word wall and of you know things that she was talking about in her reporting and things that I had seen before and not thought of because I didn't know this was like a practice or you know how, how that would um, relate to anything. And then once you have it in mind, you can look out for it. So um, I think that it, I don't know, it just, it speaks to the challenge there. Thanks. So uh, Annette Ravenel, who is a McCord School graduate, uh, has a question. How does education research deal with biases against black, brown, poor, and disabled children? Poorly. Um, I don't know. There, there's a lot of measurement, as I'm sure uh, you've ob observed in it. Um, so, you know, a lot of measuring gaps. I, I think that um, one of the big problems is this question of who asks the questions and trying to, you know, get these tools out so that communities can ask the questions that are important to them. Um, is is one thing you know driving us with the book but you know if the question is how does education research deal with this um you know there's a range of of answers but education research as in the what works clearinghouse what you'll see is um you know like what you can try to do is figure out what is 
the context of the study. Where was this implemented and evaluated and is this similar? Um, but there's really, um, for students with disabilities, there's a real lack of research. And w when you're looking for statistical significance, you're looking for sample size, <laughs> kind of any small group becomes a, a problem. Um, and researchers, you know, do a lot of work in very big districts that have many schools so that they can get sample size. Uh, and then that also means you don't have a lot of research that's done in a rural context. Um, so there's uh, education research as it is right now in a formal sense is missing a lot um, that I think if we think of leaders and practitioners only as consumers of research will never really get to. It's more like William was talking about that you have to be generating um, your own research by looking at your data and asking your own questions. So uh, relatedly, uh, Sylvan uh, Tuckman of the Center on Reinventing Public Education wonders how, uh, I guess especially in the ESSA environment, uh, do we as researchers address the issue of, of subgroups? Uh, and I, I guess this goes to sample size, uh, the issue of sample size. Um, but uh, uh, as Sylvan points out, there, there's not very much evidence on the effect of many interventions on ELL students, on students with disabilities, and, and other sort of n narrower groups of students. So uh, is, is there a way out of that wilderness? Yeah, I think, you know, one hope is that over time, right, you can accumulate, this is sort of what Emily was talking about, that over time you accumulate a larger body of, of research. Um, there's always going to be, as Nora said, there's, you know, going to be the sample size issue for particular populations. And then the question is, you know, where those, um, where some of those groups are most represented, um, you know, are there ways to make sure at, at least we're doing some research there. I mean, I think one of the things that you'll see in, um, I think particularly in national studies, um, but also just because of the, the um, confluence of universities being around urban centers as well, is there's going to be a lot of urban and sometimes suburban overrepresentation in um, education research. Um, it becomes really costly. So uh, I don't think anyone's, you know, referenced sort of rural education. But when you're driven by having to have these large sample sizes, you can do it in rural education, but then you're raising the cost of the research because getting out into the field in all these places, or you know, I've worked with rural districts where we actually had to go on site to hand enter their data from paper files into electronic form. Um, you know, there's a whole sort of range of other challenges that come up. I think what this means is that you're going to get. In some ways, you're going to get over-representation of some populations, particularly those that are uh, most represented in urban districts in a lot of the education research that we see. Um, which again, you know, this, this point about like how, how do we help people locally generate as strong research or as strong evidence as possible within their own context to kind of help build that up. Um, and how do we create sort of networks for communicating or disseminating what people are learning locally through their practitioner networks, through, I can't remember, there's, a, there's one section of AERA that was, um, that was specifically for like district research folks um, where they could get together and sort of meet about stuff. But how do you create some of that so that can get shared and sort of peer reviewed on, on that kind of level. Um, but I think those are some of the pathways to getting less represented populations better represented is, you know, how, how do we help folks locally have better skills at hand to be able to do good research on their own and sort of push themselves one level more rigorous. And just one follow up for the that? students with Sorry, can I ask a quick follow-up to, to him. How do we do that? Maybe you're going to answer that question. How do we get the average school district with 1,600 students in three schools, uh, and there are you know, literally thousands of them across the country, how do we get them up to speed where they have the capacity to, to be sort of owning their own research? Sorry, North. Yeah, that's, that's totally great. You know, so um, 
So what I worked in a 3,500 school district, um, 3,500 student um, district um, as the research director there. I think there's, there are some things that are promising. So one is I do think that there are more, there's more availability in graduate programs for students in different types of education leadership and other programs are now getting like evidence type courses as part of their um, curriculum. So when they go out and they become district leaders, I do think we're seeing more education on that side than existed 10, 15 years ago. Um, second, I think it's, I actually think the process of doing research for those of us who are researchers, it is really important that we do research with people and not to people. Um, you know, in, in our K-12 group, I talk about uh, relevance, rigor, and relationships. And the doing of research involves building relationships and sustaining those relationships. And that means treating all the people involved in that research endeavor as partners and being open to learning from them and hearing their critiques of what they're doing and encouraging them to be open to hearing sort of what we have to say about, hey, there might be a, a better way that you can do this. And so the, the more people are participating in that research from this sort of mutually affirming perspective, I feel like that's a way that over time we can get more and more um, folks at the ground level exposed to thinking about research with a, like a broader lens. Great. Nora, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, I was just thinking on the Savan's question about students with disabilities, I think um, you know, aside from sample size, a really big problem there is that students with disabilities are supposed to have an individualized educational program, um, not some standardized, faithfully implemented intervention that's the same for everyone. And so then the question of how are you evaluating, you know, Johnny's IEP is, uh, then it's it's very challenging. Um, so I think for special education, um, there needs to be sort of a lot more openness to other types of research that are still rigorous, but it's not going to be an RCT. Got it. Thanks. Uh, so uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, one is from uh, Melissa Young uh, from the Fed Ed Group. Uh, who is wondering if uh, you all have any ideas on how to use evidence to select effective core curriculum uh, and related professional development materials for general education classrooms. That might be a question that every uh, parent in America has at the same time at the moment. Sort of I get asked ideas. that all the time and I always re refuse to, I mean, I, well, I refuse to answer of any particular curriculum. I think it's a hard one. I mean, I, you know, there are people out there who rate curriculum and you, and that, like what works Clearinghouse, you have to understand their system of rating and what they're rating it against. So, you know, some people are rating against the common core standards and they need to think about what that means. Um, you know, so it's very difficult. I think this isn't totally answering the question, but I think a really important thing here is the translation of a particular program or approach into practice or the translation, like if you've got something and you know that it works, how do you know that it's gonna work again and again? And in particular, when it comes to curriculum, um, what's the professional development that's gonna go with it? Like how much is being invested and how good is the investment? in teaching the teachers and others how to really use it and how to learn from it. Because as we know, a lot of stuff that comes along with curriculum or that school districts come up with is a one or a two day or a few days over the summer or a day three times a year and there's really no follow up and one teacher gets trained for a few days and then that teacher has to train all the other teachers and it's like a game of telephone. And so I think that's a big problem with curriculum in this country is that professional development doesn't come along with it. And there is some evidence that when there is prof good professional development that goes along with the curriculum, the educators perceive that curriculum as higher quality, even if it might not be. <laughs> so like it kind of goes both ways. Like it's super important to have the professional development but just because there's good professional development there doesn't necessarily mean that the curriculum or the approach itself is high quality. So I don't know, there's no easy answers on any of this stuff. No, for sure. Uh, so we're just about a time. Uh, Nora, I'm gonna give you the, the, the last word uh, and then I'm gonna plug your book. Great, 
Thank you. Um, well, thanks everyone for tuning in and for um, a lot of great questions that I'm sorry we didn't have time to get to today. Um, but I think, you know, sort of these themes of needing to sort of ask the questions and really the, the reason we wrote the book is we're hoping that people working in education can internalize this framework where you're just always asking, how do I know that this is the problem I have? You know, how, I, I think this, how, what can I rule out? Um, what objective information do I have? How do I know that I'm considering a range of possibilities? Um, and, and so that it just becomes sort of second nature. And I think this requires some cultural shifts in school districts and schools. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of getting to this point where it's not rude to ask someone how they know something. Uh, but that's where we hope that this will go. So thank you all for being part of this today. Yeah, and, and thank everybody for, for uh, tuning in, as they say. And uh, thanks uh, to Nora and William and Emily for their very thoughtful responses. Uh, and, and to uh, what was a great conversation. Uh, those of you who would like to get the book, it is again, Common Sense Evidence, and uh, it is published by the Harvard Education Press. There you go, there's a visual. Thank you all again, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye.